with us. Uh, Robert Kevin uh, uh, has been involved in the design and analysis of electrological systems for over 40 years. Um, he is uh, the holder of half a dozen patents and the author of numerous publications. Uh, he currently, this might be of interest for many of you, is currently leading an internal funded study investigating the potential applications of computational imaging and display uh, for radio and products. Outside of work, she also has uh, many uh, thousand hours of flight in sail, in sail plane uh, aircraft. So, right. welcome to Boulder. Thank you, Ariel. And thank you all for attending. Uh, we'll start into the presentation in a, in a minute. You can all hear me fine. What you see up here, for those of you that have never seen a thermal imaging camera, this is a thermal imaging camera. I don't know if we can... Doesn't make any difference whether it's pitch black or fully light, you'll see exactly the same scene. It's measuring body heat, the thermal emissions. So. Uh, You know, that's, that's what it's, it's seeing out here, is just your body heat. And you can see, uh, you know, if you were to put a, borrow this for a second, put a hot hand on that, you should be able to see the imprint of the hand. So it's just measuring, thank you, just measuring heat. Uh, the main place you'd see that these days is either commercially in firefighters, helmets, invaluable in going into a smoky, burning building and finding people. Or, of course, where Raytheon is mainly focused, the infrared uh, for the military. Let's them operate nighttime just as easily as daytime. Get a full image like that. We've got a couple of cameras up here. I won't dwell on that anymore, but if anyone has any more interest or questions afterwards, be glad to, to entertain that. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. Let's see. Does that look like? Uh, yeah, we might be better off with uh, PowerPoint. With PowerPoint. How about that? Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is computational imaging for electro-optical sensors, which is kind of where most of Raytheon's focus is. And I'm going to kind of start with a brief overview of what Raytheon is and does, and then talk about some of the potential applications. Uh, we do have to skirt around some details for ITAR and proprietary reasons, but I'll try and give you a, a broad overview of, of where we might use computational imaging and show you some examples. So again, what is Raytheon? What do we do? What's an EO, an electro-optical sensor? Kind of where we've been, where we are today, and what computational imaging might give us as we head into the future. Okay, Raytheon. Major corporation, about 71,000 employees, 25 billion in sales. Surprisingly enough, it kind of started out uh, as a, an appliance manufacturer. And during the war, they uh, did some uh, radar tube development, kind of led to the original radar range just after uh, the war ended, changed the name to Raytheon, late 50s. They kind of went through a buying binge in the mid 90s and acquired Ross Perot's E Systems, Texas Instruments, which I was a part of, and Hughes Electronics defense business. And kind of made a major supplier of 
electro-optical and radar systems for uh, both uh, military and, and civilian applications. And this is uh, kind of the leadership of Raytheon. It's headquartered in uh, Waltham, Mass, Massachusetts, Swanson, and we've got uh, these six major divisions. The integrated defense systems, uh, the Patriot that you hear about uh, trying to shoot down SCUDs, that's done there. The ISS division, IIS, is a lot of uh, intelligence analysis from overhead satellite assets. That's in Dallas. That's the old E-Systems of Ross Perot. Missile Systems is down in Tucson. That's the Phoenix and Sidewinder and Paveway and a whole bunch of uh, uh, missile systems. Network-centric systems is in Dallas. That's part of the old Texas Instruments group. And they make uh, from sensors that go on vehicles uh, to uh, homeland defense. They have a homeland defense group. That's, uh, they have a contract to provide security. Didn't make the greatest publicity for the New York Port Authority. Remember a month ago somebody climbed over a fence on the runway. That was a Raytheon system that <laughs> didn't generate the best publicity. Space and Airborne Systems is, uh, as it says, both uh, space, a lot of satellite assets. Uh, they put a sensor up on the uh, uh, recent VIRS, the meteorological satellites that are doing a lot of overhead imaging for weather prediction, as well as, uh, uh, for example, the Predator UAV that you see uh, all the footage from. And technical services, uh, they have people down in Antarctica uh, handling uh, base support for the Antarctic uh, mission down there. Say spread out across the country, El Segundo to Waltham, Mass. Uh, Garland is the Ross Perot's old system. These are headquarters, so uh, even though SAS has a significant Texas presence, they're headquartered in El Segundo, just outside LAX airport, and so on. So spread across the country. There are also foreign uh, businesses in uh, Britain, France, Italy. OK, electro-optics, kind of a branch looking at how we can measure optical properties through measurement of its electric field. And for us, that's a sensor that measures that electric field. Those of you that aren't familiar, what I've shown here is the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, from gamma rays all the way out to VLF, very low frequency. Our electro-optical sensors are probably could be considered focused right around the visible and infrared. Our eyes operate in the visible, and thermal emissions peak out in the infrared. That's what you were seeing in this camera. So the visible region, near infrared, out to about three microns, mid-wave infrared, long-wave infrared. These cameras operate in the long-wave infrared. We like to operate there because a normal room temperature object has, those of you that have taken physics at some point, the Planck black body emission peaks at about 10 microns at 300 Kelvin. So the peak of normal room temperature emissions are out in this region. So we like to operate out there when we can. There are two atmospheric windows, aren't shown here. Of course, the visible, where our eyes utilize the mid-wave 3 to 5. There's a window in the atmosphere with relatively high transmission and the long-wave infrared 8 to 12. So those are kind of where we operate. These are some examples from the Raytheon product line. You know, thermal imaging. This happens to be an example from a, a thermal imager. This was taken out in, uh, in Santa Barbara. 
mountains in the background there. This is the uh, Veers imager. This happens to be showing uh, Hurricane Katrina just re getting ready to go ashore a couple of months ago. The city lights of, uh, I think that's New Orleans, Galveston, Houston, of course, Florida. So they make that sensor, has 22 channels visible to IR. An interesting, uh, another case is uh, SWIR, shortwave infrared. That's between about one and three microns. The advantage there is haze penetration. That wavelength does a good job at penetrating haze, but yet doesn't have the cooling requirements of some of the more sensitive thermal infrared. Though, of course, these are uncooled. But uh, one to two, one to three microns does depend on reflected illumination. There's very little emitted ambient. Though there is a phenomena called sky glow, if there's no real dense cloud overhead, there is an upper stratospheric layer of excited molecules that uh, even after the sun is set will admit a significant amount of ambient illumination that in these bands that can be used for SWIR. This is a nighttime scene taken with a SWIR camera. Okay, uh, where have we been? Traditionally, not much computation. Really just sent the image to the eye. Person looked at it. We might do gain and level, just DC offset plus gain slope correction. We might be an analog target tracker in there. If you wanted to follow a, a vehicle through a scene, you could put a target tracker on it and that would automatically follow it, and if there was a gimbal, maybe move the gimbal to follow that. But pretty much all analog. As we've gotten computational resources in the past decade, we begin to expand that some. Non-uniformity correction. Just as you can imagine, there are a quarter million to multiple million pixels in these cameras. Usually there's a little difference, they're a little offset. Salt and pepper might look like. And so non-uniformity correction puts a uniform scene out in front of that camera and then measures the offsets. If the scene's uniform and you've got offsets, you just store that and you can correct after the fact. Local area processing, dynamic range expansion is an attempt to do gain and level correction in local regions. So you don't have to determine one gain and level setting for the entire image. Because maybe up here in the sky, there's a lot of bright sun and cold blue sky. And down here, maybe you don't need that dynamic range. It's all the same. So, Local area processing is a dynamic range expansion attempt to change gain and level locally. This little area, and then this, and then this, and so on. But relatively unsophisticated, but you can kind of see the trend. I want to make the point here. Yeah, computational imaging isn't a totally new thing. CAT scans, we're all familiar with those. They've been around. That's a purely computational tomography scheme. Synthetic aperture radar, you may or may not heard of. That's been around in military use for several decades. You know, what you see every weekend, football line markers. That's computationally generated from an array of cameras around the football stadium. Free uh, viewpoint video. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but you, know, you kind of see the individual walking through, the one I remember is a commercial where an individual walks through a plaza with birds flying all around and the camera moves through that environment and you get the feeling like it's a floating camera. 
You know, that's all from multiple cameras processed into a 3D reconstruction that you can then move through. So the point is, you know, it's not n totally new. It has been around. And so let's look at some examples. And we'll spend a little bit of time on this. So I think it's interesting, and we can talk about it. It's a commercial, uh, commercially available product now. The Mosaic Aware multi-gigapixel camera, funded by DARPA. Dr. David Brady from Duke. Uh, he, you may have, some of you may have met him. I understand he has visited up here. Leads up this program for a visible spectrum camera, large field of view, greater than 90 degrees, diffraction limited resolution over that entire field. And this kind of gives you an idea of the size. There's a soccer ball. The actual lens is right here. All this are the micro optics and camera electronics to collect that. We'll show you some details but there are several hundred cameras back here. All off-the-shelf commercial Aptina cell phone cameras. Same kind of thing you might have in your cell phones. Except here there's several hundred of them packaged together. And this is kind of how it works. This is what uh, Dr. Brady calls a multi-scale design. Here's three layouts for three classes of camera. That thing I showed right in the center. Page up. That's the ball lens that you see right here. This is the ball lens. What you were looking at right there was this two gigapixel camera. 300 of these micro cameras are arrayed around a sphere, a hemisphere, partial sphere with this being the ball lens and then this relay group that is the micro camera. And so Dr. Brady's concept was don't try and build a curved focal plane of this size if you want high resolution over a broad field. Take these little commercial cameras that cost $1.50 a piece and use 300 of them over a curved surface. Now you have the advantage of a curved focal plane without having to develop one. And part of the beauty of this concept is you want more resolution, you want 10 gigapixels, okay? Bigger ball lens to support the, the imaging, but almost the same micro lens group. A few minor changes in curvature, but basically the same barrel, the same size, the same mechanical mounting. 40 gigapixels, same thing. Bigger lens, no longer a ball lens because of the size, but again, same basic concept. So this allows you to grow with the same basic micro lens design, a broad class of applications all depending on computational. You can imagine there's 300 of these little seams in there, little cameras that have to all be seamed up and gain and level corrected. And this is an example of Seattle taken here. This is the, the full image. This is what the camera looks like with these micro lenses populated. This is the ball lens and this is Right over there. That's the needle, do they call it? Seattle, uh, in Seattle. And you can kind of just barely see it. Now, I'll tell you what, let's try and see if we can look at an image. This is, uh, this will be in the uh, presentation. The link here is a publicly available link that you can call up and go in and click on the aware camera images. That's the Seattle skyline. And then you can go in. Let's go see if we can 
find that. Yeah. Trying to see if I can get the. Yeah. We should be able to zoom in on that in this application. But we didn't get a chance to try this. Let's. Uh, Go back and see if another image. This is taken at uh, a group meeting in Seattle. Let's see if, uh, okay, this works a little better here. We can actually get the, so remember, that's the, the whole image that the camera takes. It was turned on its side. And now you can go in and zoom in. You can see where some of the camera areas have overlapped. Those of you that remember what Dr. Brady looked like, that's Dr. Brady in the, in the center there. Those of you that might know Mike Game from University of Arizona. So the thought is that this camera has the wide field of view to look at a, a very scattered scene and yet also has the ability to zoom in on specific points of interest. Uh, Brady talks about maybe using it to, for wildlife surveys where you can capture an image of a wildlife preserve if you want to know how many geese happen to be residing at that particular location at any one time. There's no other way to do it, really, to capture at any one instant of time that big a field of view and then go and later count these are how many geese happen to be there. And I think they may actually have a, uh, I don't know if they, I don't know whether this will, yeah. We may or may not be able to, but this is kind of the idea. You can go in there and how many geese are flying and again, zoom out and get the whole broad scene. So at any rate, that's kind of the idea behind uh, Brady's camera. Let's see, oh, we went back to the Adobe Reader. Okay, so if you want to play with that later, you can go to that link and hunt around there and your mouse may work better than this one and you'll actually be able to navigate around this scene. Okay, let's look at some of the other applications. This is one that's been around quite a while, reduced optical length. Traditionally, we've got a single aperture to do a, uh, some imaging function. We look at the insects, and they don't work that way. They've typically got dozens or hundreds or thousands of little micro apertures. Japanese scientists came up with this kind of concept about a decade ago, called it Tombo, which is apparently a Japanese name for a dragonfly with a similar eye structure. We did team with Duke University in the early part of the uh, 2000s and had a program with DARPA to look into this. The basic idea is you can cut the effective focal length of a particular system down by a significant fraction, you know, just decrease the effective focal length. That impacts the resolution. How do you regain that lost resolution? You have multiple small 
lenslets. And you use what's essentially superposition dither. You have each of these little lenslets displaced a little bit, so you actually get additional samples on your ultimate focal plane to recover the resolution you lost when you shrunk the effective focal length. Okay. Oops. This was another technique for reducing the length. And that was annular optics. Uh, the same program from DARPA led a team from University of Arizona that looked into this. What they did was the rays are coming in, we don't show them here, but the rays are coming in in this fashion through an annular region, just a circle around the outer edge, but they're undergoing multiple bounces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that lets you fold the system into a much more compact shape. You do have a large central obscuration, which is a problem for systems, particularly as you get to the longer wavelengths where diffraction gets to be more important. And typically, there's some form of wavefront encoding used to improve the resolution on these systems. But makes a very short effective focal, a very short system for a given effective focal length. And what I'm trying to do in each of these cases is give you a reference. You want to follow up on this? Uh, Tremblay from uh, UC San Diego talks about this in, in applied optics. Again, you should have all these slides available after the fact. <clears throat> Hyperspectral, there's a lot of interest in more than one color, multiple colors. You're all familiar with red, green, blue, you know, which is sort of a form of hard hyper, maybe multispectral. But this, normally we use the term hyperspectral, we go beyond that. Maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe 200 different spectral channels. There are a number of techniques one could use. This uh, tomographic approach is talked about here. This is about 10 years old, you know, a little older than that, 97. They have a dispersive element that they then rotate constantly, uh, kind of in a way like the, the CAT scans you're familiar with today, uh, tomography, where you've got a rotating element. And it's the same kind of a principle here. They rotate the dispersive spectrum, and they can recover with some degree of accuracy. There are some issues, that data. Another approach is uh, Dr. Brady and Mike Game uh, developed at Duke, putting a coded aperture. A couple of references there. The idea is you image down onto a binary mask, zeros and ones. In this location, you then image it, carry it onto a disperser, a prism or a grating, prism in this case, and then image that dispersed spectrum onto a detector. And knowing the code on this mask, you can recover that dispersed spectrum through some nonlinear optimization techniques. Highly compressed, so attractive from that standpoint. This is another offshoot of the multiple aperture fly's eye kind of approach for multispectral. And it's really kind of a growth of you know, what you've got in all your cameras today, the Bayer pattern is similar to this, except there's just a red, green, blue, or a red, green, blue, white. Or... So one might have 16 apertures in here, all with a different color filter on them, all imaging identical scenes onto an underlying detector. So this would be a way to get more than the three colors of your typical camera 
Post-processing is required to register and combine all those images, of course. Sparse sampling keeps coming up again and again on computational imaging. We know from all our JPEG, MPEG experiences that most of the external scenes are sparse that we deal with. JPEG and MPEG deal with that after the fact. Is there some way to take advantage of that sparse nature of our typical scenes before the fact? And Rich Baraniak at Rice demonstrated a, an intriguing single pixel camera. The way this works is you take your lens and image down onto a DMD. One of the devices like TI puts in their televisions or projectors. I think you've got a number of them around here. And you put a binary code on that. And then focus that down onto just one detector. The trick is, if you want to collect a million pixels, if the scene was not sparse, you'd have to take a million samples, a million different patterns on this DMD. Go through a reconstruction to get back your original million pixels. Unique code for each time. The sparsity comes in that you usually don't have to take a million samples for a million pixels. Maybe you could get away with two tenths, you know, 20% of that, maybe 200,000. That's the good news. The bad news is, even at 35 kilohertz, 200,000 samples takes nearly 10 seconds. So this is a great technique. If you can convince someone to stand still for 10 seconds, maybe it wasn't as bad as daguerreotype when you know, they had to have someone stand there for whatever it was, 15 minutes. I've seen them where they had those old photographers had stands that they actually positioned the people in so they could maintain that position long enough to get a good photograph. But at any rate, this does work, and there are a number of references on that. It does have the challenge of it takes a while. And for a dynamic scene, you may not have a while. But it is interesting. Kind of a, a follow-up application of that same technique is not to put a single pixel, but to put a single port spectrometer. So the same setup, except rather than a single pixel detector, you put, this is an example of an ocean optics, fiber optic spectrometer. So it takes that single pixel and comes up with a spectrum. So now, rather than normally, this spectrometer would just give you the spectrum of a point in space. With the Rice concept, if you're willing to take, here's an example, you know, 20%, you need a million space wavelength voxels, take 200,000 measurements. But you get a spectrum of the full scene, not just a little point. And it's kind of with off-the-shelf commercial components. So again, you do have to stand still, whatever you're dealing with for this period, but given that caveat, a lot of power. Some of the other applications uh, one might consider. You know, high dynamic range. You've all had the experience of going out and snapping your photo, and uh, it's too dark, or it's too bright. Uh, you just can't find the right combination. So there's been a lot of activity in both visible and infrared. How can we expand that? And there have been a number of attempts. This is one reference. This approach uses subpixels with differing integration times. So here's an example of 
a number of different integrations times on that one detector, post-processed, you look and see which of your samples has the best dynamic range for the particular scene region you're in. Uh, there's also been, we've, with our SWIR cameras, we've done something similar in that uh, the integration times are short. We'll take three or four different quick integration times at different lengths in one 30 hertz period and then look and see, same thing, which of those has the correct dynamic range for a particular region of the scene. So you'll have whatever, two or three or four stacked images same your cameras will do the same thing, right? You can set it up to take uh, three or four images with different f-stops. and Pull down the button, it'll go snap, 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 snap. Now you need the software after the fact to go and look in and see which image is best or more sophisticated in a different sub-region, which image is best. But again, computational imaging to extend dynamic range. It's kind of a fascinating uh, idea. We get so used to cameras just working like our eye. We just make a normal image. Well, nothing says that you can't take a nonlinear format and then rectify it later. And so there's been a lot of work with these hyperhemispherical image sometimes for sky imaging, sometimes for surveillance. This is an example of one that looks around the complete circle as well as directly overhead. It's kind of clever in that this edges image the surround hemispherically. Of course, it's a donut. You got a hole in the top. And so this little lens images the top donut all onto a single detector, you get this kind of thing, and then after post-processing rectification, you get a normal distortion-free image. Kind of clever. The Navy's looking at this for some of their periscopes. You know, everybody remembers the old World War II movies where the periscope goes up and the poor guy sits there rotating around while the destroyer bears down on him from behind. <laughs> well, this concept the Navy has, they're going to just pop up this thing quickly, take a snapshot, and snap it down. And then the commander can, underwater this time, with his periscope down, inspect what's around him. We're kind of clever. Computational imaging. Super resolution. I did you say just quickly, there's a couple of meanings for super resolution, particularly in the academic community. A lot of times it means I want to see out beyond the diffraction limit. We don't use it that way, typically in industry. That's a little too ambitious for us. So what we mean is I've got an undersampled image. And what an undersampled image is the detector is bigger than the optics point spread function, so a star you image a star, that's a representation of the optics point spread function. If the detector is bigger than that, you're not limited by the optics anymore, you're limited by the detector. So that's what we mean by super resolution, you're undersampled. You know, the point spread function's this big and your samples are huge, undersampled. If it were oversampled, it would be the other way. You'd have this point spread function and these little detectors. You're oversampled. So un anyways, undersampled. If you're undersampled and your detector's too big, what you can do is move the detector a little bit and take another sample. Move the detector a little bit and take another sample. Or maybe your platform just jitters, just shakes. You're on an airplane and it's always shaking. Maybe you have multiple images, each with a little bit of an offset. If you can put those all together, you can improve this undersampled imagery. Again, not trying to get beyond the diffraction limit. And this is an example from this particular paper uh, that shows 
a vehicle tread, and, and you know, sometimes you've got to use imagination to show this. And I, I can hardly even see it here, but there is a very slight advantage between this and this, and certainly you can see it between these two, that there is some slight gain in uh, what they mean by uh, interpolated low resolution is they just simply took this and did a, an interpolative estimate, linear or nonlinear, as to what the intervening pixels might be. So they didn't use any multiple pixel, multiple frame information. They just interpolated the static frame. So that's a good thing to compare against. <clears throat> Increased depth of field. I'm sure everybody's sometimes gets tired or Maybe they made a mistake and they didn't get the focus right on their camera. Well, there's that gone. Uh, there are some commercial uh, approaches now. The Lytro camera is a, a one approach to get around that. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the Lytro camera here, though maybe I should have. You know, where they, they measure the incident ray angle and can reconstruct full depth field. This is a slightly different approach that uses a cubic phase mask. What it does is make the optics resolution poor, but uniformly and predictably poor, independent of focus range. So it doesn't make any difference whether you're focused at 2 feet or 50 feet. The image looks lousy. But you know how lousy it looks. You know how to recover that. And it's always the same recovery technique, independent. So that's the approach. The optical transfer function is insensitive to misfocus. The same digital processing can restore the image for all ranges. Nothing's free. That restoration process introduces noise. It's essentially a gain. And the noise gains up just like the image you're trying to recover. And, and that, that's a real challenge if you are operating in low noise conditions, which invariably you often have to. Turbulence mitigation. Everybody's been out there, and you know, particularly at longer ranges, everything kind of shifts and Twinkles, atmospheric turbulence, you know, twinkling stars, an example of, of uh, scintillation. You have the same thing across terrestrial ranges. You know, the astronomers, you're probably aware, you know, they shoot a guide star up, and they're able to measure the twinkling of that guide star, which is essentially just a laser fluorescing in the upper atmosphere, and correct the star twinkling of their field. Of course, you don't have that advantage for a, a terrestrial scene, but there are approaches. You know, this is one approach, lucky imaging. The thought is, it's never constant. It's always kind of wavering and swinging, and sometimes it's sharp, and sometimes it's not. If you collect a group of frames and then inspect them and see which one is sharp, OK, I'm going to grab that little area there. Oh, now next frame, this area is sharp. I'm going to keep it. And then slowly assemble a composite frame with all those little good regions, those lucky frames, into a final synthetic image. And Vorontsov gives a reference there for that, uh, that approach. OK, to kind of wrap it up, uh, you know, we've had four centuries since the invention of the telescope. Really, it's only in the last 50 years or so that computer technology has gotten to the point where we can seriously consider integrating it with our optical systems. Not taking two weeks to post-process, but two seconds. So I think, you know, the potential is, is really just coming on now. And the work that uh, you people are doing here in universities 
like Boulder and other universities across the country are really going to show dramatic improvements in our electro-optical sensors over the next uh, decade or more. I think that's it. I think what we have next is just a series of references. If anyone's interested after the fact, there is a whole series of references. You can look into this a little deeper. With that, thank you very much. Let's see, by SBIR, and you don't mean the old group that used to be? Not SBIR, Yeah. No, we have a focal plane research group in Goleta, Santa Barbara, that we mostly deal with. Uh, so, yeah, we don't, don't deal with SBIR, uh, except for their... Uh, collimator and testing products, not their focal planes. Um, I was really surprised to see that in the 40 gigapixel version of Brady's camera, it's no longer a spherical mm -hmm. uh, lens. So it seems like there's something beautiful about this spherical lens concept. It has this in and so to get to more pixels, you go away from this beautiful symmetric thing back to a, and it was to a smaller angle. I mean, why do you get more gigapixels when you go to smaller angle and less cool? Uh, let's go find that. Okay. Yeah, you notice that's, uh, that's not a 100 degree lens. The ball lens is really driven by the requirement to go out to 100 degrees with reasonably constant aberrations. If you didn't have constant aberrations as a function of angle, you would need to tune these micro cameras for those different aberrations. The 40 gigapixel already has 400 micro cameras. If you were to go to 100 degrees, you would need some kind of a ball lens. But it would become enormous because of the swing of that big pupil, and you'd have, you know, 15, 16, 2,000 micro cameras. So what they decided when they went to this 40 gigapixel, they weren't going to try and do 100 degree. It's just 30 degrees. And that gave them the freedom now not to have this great big ball lens, which, you know, would get progressively bigger, but just to have this simple landscape format. Does that make any sense? Well, so it seems like it's easier to get to 40 gigapixels than 2 gigapixels. That seems weird. I mean, that's a conventional lens is what I assume that is. It's more or less, that's a conventional lens. Yeah, a symmetric landscape lens. Yeah. Yeah. So why is it easier to get to 40 gigapixels than 2 gigapixels? That seems weird. Well, I don't know. Do you say it's easier? I mean, there are... The problem they were having, one of the problems with these ball lenses, you can see how thick they are. They didn't have people that were shot, or anybody, O'Hara, that was making glass thick enough to go to these kind of sizes. This ball, this is about the upper limit that today they could get standard slabs to make the glass ball lens out of. They looked when they, if they were going to try and go to a 40 gigapixel, they were over the capability without contracting a custom, you know, million dollar melt to build a slab that, if they could, to build a slab that thick to build that ball lens. So the approach was, we're not going to try and do a ball lens, we'll just build a standard landscape lens, but we won't do 100 degrees, we'll only do 30. Right. Uh, you know, it doesn't change that much. Let's see. 
the main, you can see the main determining factor here is not the optics right here in the center of the ball lens. It's these electronics. And I don't have a picture of, they have a new 2 gigapixel with some updated electronics that are considerably smaller, you know, I don't know, maybe three quarters the size of this. But in each, in each case, it's really this electronics package and not the ball lens that dictates the final package size. Though you can see they are, you know, they're getting a little longer. So there is some length stretch, but this basic curvature of 400 micro cameras, since the micro lenses stay the same, remains about the same size. Now, of course, this is a little smaller because it's only 30 degrees. Okay. We do have some infrared cameras here if anyone wants to come up uh, after the fact. Or... Okay. Yeah. You presented a lot of different examples of computational imaging, but what I didn't get a good feel for is which, which of these did Raytheon specifically work on? Okay, it's a good question. And I think one I'm going to have to avoid. <laughs> uh, the reasons are twofold, proprietary and ITAR. So a lot of our applications are restricted. Uh, we can't discuss with foreign nationals. Others are proprietary that we just as soon not let Lockheed or DRS or L3 know about. So I, I'm, my apologies, I, I had to kind of go lightly over our specific plans to apply computational imaging. I will say we've got a multi-year internally funded program on that we're executing to try and determine how to apply computational imaging to our systems. And, you know, maybe we need to engage uh, UC Boulder here a little more deeply in that. Can you speak to at least like the breadth? Like, are you guys looking at a lot of different technologies, or are you focusing on a couple of different Right now, we have uh, a number of universities under funding to investigate different approaches, trying to determine is there a good fit to our products? Or is there a whole new class of products that maybe we hadn't considered before? So yeah, it is a very broad focused effort trying to determine what's the potential for computational imaging. And the jury's out. You know, it's not clear today, not to say in 10 years when you people can develop some new technologies, that it won't be there, but we're still very much in an exploratory mode. Is my process there on your list? Medical? No, it isn't. Though it's one of those things that, you know, if there were a field, you got to remember too, you know, Raytheon is predominantly a defense focused company. Uh, so it's not to say we wouldn't go into another avenue, particularly in an exploratory mode, but we don't have right now a lot of microscopy related applications. We don't do much medical imaging. We had, again, another one of those cases, we had a thermal uh, a medical branch that was developing thermal uh, thermography for breast cancer detection. And we sold that off once it got to be of a certain size. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you.